namaste louis welcome welcome to ahimsa conversations thank you so much for making time thank um, you for inviting me uh, so with many speakers i begin by asking what is your earliest recollection maybe even from childhood of the concept or the idea of non violence or it could be a lived experience so um well, I don't know for sure, except when I was in high school, <clears throat> we lived um, half a block away from the American Friends Service Committee and the, the Friends, the Quaker Meeting House in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, it, it turned out that my closest friends in high school were uh, associated with the AFSC because it ran a series of youth programs. Um, we had discussion groups where we <clears throat> we pretended we were intellectuals and we had work camps where we went to the poorer neighborhoods and tried to do good things. But of course, the, the Quakers are famous as proponents of nonviolence. <clears throat> and um, but more specifically, probably I was <clears throat> I was active in the civil rights movement for a while. In the summer of 1964, I went to Mississippi there was a Mississippi Freedom Summer, which was intended to organize and register voters um, and to reorganize the Democratic Party. But um, it was one of the organizing groups was SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Organizing Committee. And um, and it was on, <laughs> on our end, it was supposed to be a nonviolent summer. Which it was. I mean, one of the organizing groups of the Freedom Summer was SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Organizing Committee. And we were all trained in nonviolence in the simple sense of um, if you're being attacked, what should you do? You should lie down on the ground and assume a fetal position. Um, and so these are my earliest memories is uh, in, the, in the United States. <clears throat> the civil rights movement, particularly coming out of Martin Luther King, had nonviolence as one of its principles. Yes. Then, of course, things got complicated, but that's my earliest memories of nonviolence in my life. When Dr. King was uh, killed, uh, did that, for your generation, did that alter the validity or the authenticity of nonviolence, or did it reinforce it? So that same year, uh, Robert Kennedy was murdered. Right. And um, I don't think it really changed uh, those of us who believed in nonviolence. I don't think it changed that community because in a funny way, by inversion, it, it proved the point that violence is not the path. I actually have a story about this, which is I, in the United States, um, young men at that time were drafted into the army and you were allowed to uh, object through matters of conscience and, um, and not go into the army, but do some other alternative service. But you had to go before your draft board and explain what, what your conscientious objection was. And uh, that summer, I, I was a CO as we call them. And, um, the morning I was to go before my draft board, my mother woke me up and told me that Bobby Kennedy had been shot. So the same day I was going to try to explain why I was not in favor of violence, uh, we had a, a, a serious murder in this country. And it may be one of the reasons why when I got to the draft board, they really had no questions. They just said, I see you want to not fight. Well, that's OK. We'll have we'll do something else with you. <laughs> so I was all prepared for philosophical arguments about what would happen if my loved ones were murdered, but they never came up. Mm, yeah. And today, uh, Louis, now 40 years, almost 50 years later, how how do you see uh, violence today? Or And equally, how would you today define nonviolence? And it doesn't have to be a narrow definition. Um, <clears throat> so right now in our country, we are in the, th in the throes of a 
politically motivated, um, <laughs> you know, endemic of violence. Um, you know, Donald Trump and people of his ilk are uh, publicly stoking fantasies of, of violence and violent overthrow of institutions. So it's much on our mind. I have been involved with writing letters to voters in various states, urging them to get out to vote. And on these letters, the thing that I always put down, I say, um, I vote because voting is the nonviolent way that we preserve or change our system. So in a way, I don't think people necessarily connect voting and nonviolence, but in fact, a part of the point of voting is that this is how distributed power uh, can be organized to do something uh, without uh, violent means. So there's that. <laughs> uh, your work as a, uh, uh, as a thinker, as a creative writer has been very much at the heart of understanding structural violence in our times. Um, you know, for example, to quote you from your famous book, The Gift, in a free market, the people are free, the ideas are locked down. Um, so, and I know that book was a while back. You have, of course, written an equally uh, crucial book for many of us who have been struggling with how to understand uh, uh, the market and whether the bazaar can be rescued back uh, by society. Um, today, how do you see this? Is it, I mean, what is the nature of the structural violence? And I'm going to uh, request you to assume that most of my readers have not read your work. So please, uh, if you could, you know, just uh, broadly <laughs> convey your understanding of this. Well, I'll just say a simple uh, summary of what that book is about, which yes, may help please. your Thank listeners. You. So um, this is a book about gift exchange as a kind of economic system. Uh, most of the early work thinking about gift exchange came out of anthropology, where people went into supposedly primitive groups and saw that often there was no market in the modern sense of cash exchange or I mean, people always had different forms of exchange, but that often uh, the main way that good circulated was through gifts. And uh, there's an early essay on this by a Frenchman named Marcel Moss, who uh, says that in a gift exchange community, there are three obligations. You have the obligation to give, the obligation to receive, and um, the obligation to express gratitude. So, um, the way my book originated, I am a writer and uh, was struggling with my own questions about how to have an adult life as a writer. And I decided to take the language and studies of gift exchange and apply them to artistic practice. So um, I take the three or four things you can say about what happens when you treat property as a gift. One of them, the main one is a gift exchange tends to uh, engender connections between people. If I give you something, and particularly if you like it and you do something in response, it be, it's the beginning of relationship. Uh, whereas to say this the other way around, part of the great virtue or curse <laughs> of commodity exchange is that there's no connection. You know, I could travel from my home in Boston to where you are in India and uh, pay cash the whole way and never meet anybody and have no obligations. So there's great mobility and so forth, but um, but it leaves us as strangers to one another. And uh, so you can say these different things. And some of them, I think, are applicable to, uh, to artists. I mean, I begin with a simple uh, <laughs> insight that people talk about uh, a talent as a gift. And... Um, and then you have to ask, where, where where does the gift come from? And what are your obligations to the gift? And is your work that you make as an artist uh, an expression of this gift? And if it is, to whom should you give it? And so forth and so on. So that's what the book is about. It's a exploration of gift exchange and then applied to, to artistic practice. The first version of the book <clears throat> has the subtitle, uh, <laughs> The Gift, 
imagination and the erotic life of property. Can you say a little bit about what is the erotic life of property? So it goes back to this idea that gifts make a connection. And so um, I sort of invent a distinction between eros and logos and say that logos is the dividing principle. You say this thing is not that and you make distinctions. And eros is the joining up principle where you say this, this connects to that and, and you have ways of making the connection. So uh, to go back to this dichotomy, you would say that uh, market exchange is an emanation of logos and gift exchange is an emanation of eros. So um, sadly, my, my publishers over the years <laughs> began to think that the subtitle didn't help the stranger uh, who wanted to pick up an unknown book. So we've, we've dropped that, but I'm fond of the old subtitle. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. See, they also, I mean, in a nutshell, I feel, <clears throat> and you put it like this, but it's an idea that you also quote from many cultures. The gift must always move. Um, and, you know, you, uh, of course, Marcel also quoted the Maori uh, saying that what is eaten feeds once, but what is given away feeds again and again. And I wonder if this isn't also a crucial um, point or a crucial insight about what has led us to the juncture where we are today, where, uh, yes, people are free, but we have an unprecedented concentration of money wealth in the hands of very few people. Um, any reflections on that? <clears throat> well, as you say it, I think about um, the kind of egotism of, acquisition that, uh, you know, I begin with the, this strange fact that in English, when I was growing up, there's a thing called an Indian gift. And uh, it, it meant an insincere gift that somebody gave you something, but they wanted it back. And it turns out this, this term comes out of the English settlers coming to uh, the new world. And they were puzzled by the way that Native Americans treated their property. When there's something away, they did not expect the recipient to keep it. When the Indians gave a gift, they expected it to be passed along and not kept, not taken into the ego. It's not about you. And um, uh, so this is a distinction between an acquisitive community and, and uh, in a way it, it diminishes your sense of self and enlarges it in a different way. <laughs> you could say, what is the self? And yeah. in a gift exchange society, the self is something that expands into the into the sphere of other people. Yeah, you've said that very beautifully uh, about community uh, in again in the gift where you know you talk about uh, the links between anarchist theory and gift exchange. And uh, I would like to quote this for the benefit of those who would not have read the book. You say that above all, it seems correct to speak of the gift as anarchist property because both anarchism and gift exchange share the assumption that it is not when a part of the self is inhibited and restrained, but when a part of the self is given away that community appears. <laughs> well, it's an idealistic book. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, the thing is that the more I see of Say, for example, the rise in mental health issues yeah. across the world, but particularly in American society. Uh, you know, in that film, Social Dilemma, uh, what shocked, the only thing that really shocked me, the rest of it I expected, but what really shocked me was the data on teenage depression. Uh -huh. And I yeah. wonder, I wonder, you know, that I, I'm beginning to feel that maybe the actual technological uh, reality of social media is actually only exaggerating something, a problem that was already there, which is loss of community. And uh, so uh, I know that the way you tell your story, uh, and necessarily so, is in the realm of uh, the ideals that we need to reflect upon, but it has a very real, I think uh, uh, um, relevance and and you know application in everyday life and so maybe this is a good point for us to shift to something very 
uh, tangible and uh, because you were connected with the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, how do you today see the open source movement? Because see, in the world of technology, I've always seen the open source movement as a form of striving to recreate community. Or was, uh, was I... Well, am I exaggerating? <clears throat> no, I think that's right. Um, you know, the famous story about about this is um, a guy working at MIT uh, had a problem with the printer down the hall. Richard, that kept jamming. Stallman. <laughs> yeah, you're, Richard you're talking Stallman. about Stallman, right. <laughs> yes. right. So Richard Stallman, you know, they had a problem with the printer down the hall that was kept jamming and, and they wrote some software so that when it jammed, you would get a little notice or something like this. And then some years later, uh, they buy, bought a proprietary printer and it had similar software uh, privately owned. So they bought a commercial printer and it turned out that the software that ran the thing contained the software that they had written. So somebody had taken the gift that they gave to the world and enclosed it and made it something that they could make a profit off of. And this ticked them off frankly, and it was one of the seed moments that began the open source community. Um, you know, another another moment that's worth pausing over is uh, when uh, uh, Berners-Lee began to develop the protocols that now run the internet. Uh, there was a moment where one had to decide whether to take these private or oh, just give them away to the world and he gave them away to the world and uh it, it meant that they are now still in use there were earlier versions of such protocols which were proprietary and people wouldn't use them because they didn't know down the line uh what the owners would do to inhibit their use so in a way the gift was the only way to begin to set up this community or, or communal or worldwide uh thing we now call the web um, it, it isn't. It isn't necessarily in conflict with commerce. You know, clearly, the, the internet has become a great realm of commerce. But uh, the software that runs it often can only exist if it's not proprietary, not owned. Yes, and yes, isn't it ironic how very few people, even highly educated and well-informed people are not aware that the World Wide Web exists at all because of that gift. Yes, I think very few people understand um, the, the trade-offs that have enabled the web to exist and continue to. That's right, that's right. In a way also, you know, something like Wikipedia is a proof of concept. You know, this is, um, you know, it's a decentralized community. It's not community in the sense of people who go to dinner with you, but, um, it, it's a remarkable uh, phenomenon that uh, this internet encyclopedia exists and exists entirely on donations um, from individuals and from foundations and also the, the work of it is, is given. So uh, you couldn't have this without uh, the internet and uh, it, it's a, it and other things are good examples of gift exchange in a modern form. So is this uh, the papering over or the invisibilizing of, of the gift dimension, uh, which actually is, has shaped our world today, do you see that as a part of the structural violence that uh, you know afflicts our species now globally? Uh, I guess I wouldn't have thought of it that way, but of course, <laughs> I mean, you're using the word violence in a in a more general way than I might. Uh, I mean, tell me a bit about how you think right. of that term in that context. No, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you brought that up because actually I uh, often uh, disagree with very irresponsible or generalized use of the term violence because I think it, it, it belittles then the really serious forms of violence. So I thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm using the term structural violence pretty much in the way that, uh, you know, the peace studies discipline has introduced it, which is, uh, so for example, uh, 
uh, racism would be seen as a structural violence. And uh, it's a large phenomenon uh, in the economic sphere. For example, when we have displacement of people in the name of development by projects or various kinds of uh, processes, economic processes, uh, which take a heavy toll on one set of people in order to benefit another set of people, uh, that also is understood as structural violence. And from so these are commonly used terms uh, for these phenomena. Maybe what I'm doing is moving beyond that and uh, trying to unravel uh, the ways in which our dominant mindset has been shaped and is, is still, you know, being kind of um, constrained. Um, and uh, so maybe this is worth talking about. Is it is it irresponsible to use violence uh, in this discourse when we are trying to highlight or illustrate um, what is denying our species uh, some of its own creative potential? Uh, no, I think it's useful to use the word violence, particularly if you unpack it the way you just did. Um, that is, it it sort of puts an exclamation point on the some the slightly more abstract uh, terms that lie behind it. So yes, um, I mean, in this country, we now think a lot about the structural uh, racism, and I mean, I would use the terms. You know, the, these structures are. Um, aggressive or oppressive or um you know their their consequences are damaging to people uh and, and so you know now we're close to the language of of violence that's actual physical conflict and um uh it's it is useful to to notice it i suppose even because um you know, when, when, when the counter for, you know, when people begin to riot because they have been so mistreated, suddenly physical violence appears as if there were no violence before perpetrated upon them. Uh, so you get to blame the people who smash a store window and never think about <laughs> what's happened to their community such that this kind of anger cannot be contained. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a useful, it's a useful way to um, I mean, maybe, since, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. please. No, 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 no please. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to go back to your question, which of course I now don't remember, but uh, you were you were asking me about, about market. The, <clears throat> yeah, the market system as as a form, the current prevailing dominant market system as a form of structural violence. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well. It clearly is. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you know, the, I mean, the, I mean, every day there's something in the paper about um, people whose financial interests means that they are denying climate change, or they are getting rich off of uh, manipulating the market in in medicine and healthcare, uh, and all these things fit into your definition of the structural violence of the marketplace. Um, and to the degree that capitalism uh, is an engine of profit making without any sense of uh, ethical constraints, it is a it is a system of violence. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course there are efforts being made to change that. Uh, but those efforts are made within the uh, fundamental assumption that uh, the uh, the metaphysics or the philosophical framework of gift is something in our primitive past and yeah. uh, commodity is the only way for our species to now uh, move forward uh, that never gets uh, uh, you know discussed even in say the uh, socially responsible investing movement etc um since the issue of racism came up just a few minutes ago, um, I wanted to also ask you to what extent the uh, Martin Luther King legacy of nonviolence is still informing the struggle in the US. It's uh, from this distance, it's not uh, 
you know it's very not very easy to tell whether the idea has been rejected in a very mm -hmm. large way or it's it survives and i don't mean non violence only as a method of protest but the more fundamental notion which he kept repeating in many many ways that i cannot be free till the white man is freed of his and her prejudice uh, this idea that you know our freedom is mutually connected um you know i'm afraid we live in dark times in my country <laughs> your, your your vision of it from a distance is accurate to the vision we have here i feel no particular movement to resurrect the practice and philosophy of nonviolence right now um sadly it's 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 i think it's a puzzle for people how to organize these days you know the internet has changed uh the form of social life so radically you know the people can command a flash mob of some kind but this is not political action um so uh, there's very little movement that's clearly about nonviolence. Um, sad to say. Yeah, but in everyday life, uh, also, is it see if, again from a distance? It looks sometimes like cancel culture has dominated. Now, cancel culture is the very opposite of uh, you know having the. Uh, the strength uh, to believe that the other can change and that you can mutually through a process of uh, exchange with each other uh, mutually then transform the society around you. Uh, is this idea completely fantasy just now in the current atmosphere? <laughs> no, I'm sure there are many people who are trying to practice that, but it's... <laughs> there's not a groundswell of it yeah. um you know it wasn't just uh king but also uh i know this mostly from james baldwin that mm -hmm. james baldwin used to say uh there isn't a problem with black people the problem is white people and why is it the white people need blacks in this particular way that they imagine them uh and the only cure is for white folk to look at themselves and to figure out what it is that their consciousness needs such that they need somebody that they can treat the way that they treat black people. But it's the same with um, uh, the way uh, gay people get treated, the way transgender people get treated, you know, all the language around uh, an insisted normalcy of some fantasy kind is, uh, has to be turned around somehow to the people who have the fantasy and to, um, encourage them to figure out what it what it does for their uh, spiritual and psychological life. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's hard to know. I, you know, I'm sure this is going on, but there's, but it's, I, I don't know of any inspirational leader or movement at the moment that is trying to harness that those insights. Mm. It's out. It's yeah. out there to be used. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I was thrilled to know that uh, there's a Bob Dylan Center coming up and uh, <laughs> you are one of its curators. Um, yes. Would you maybe uh, bring that in here? Uh, because, I mean, is he still a living inspiration or is he only somebody that appeals to our generation? <laughs> and, but... I don't, but I don't, I... Um, it's hard. It's hard to say. I mean, he still tours. He still gives big concerts. And still, when I was teaching college, I, I only recently retired. There, there were undergraduates who are fanatic fans of Bob Dylan. So um, he has fans. And yes, this in in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is uh, <laughs> in, in the middle of no place for some of us, but uh, it's a town in in Oklahoma where there's a local family foundation which has been trying to uh invest in in local culture and they set up a folk music center and they have woody guthrie's archives and then uh, some years ago they bought bob dylan's archives and they've set up a wonderful uh center that has a great history uh museum in a sense that shows you dylan's career and places it in historical context and uh, um 
So, uh, and it's, you know, D Dylan's still, <laughs> he's still active. So, um, you know, as, as somebody of his generation, I, I'm probably blind to uh, what's going on in the, the people who are 21 years old these days. Mm. Yeah. So um, in kind of closing, uh, but I hope it will be an extended closing. What would you say today to young people who, you know, because I do find a great deal of restlessness in a lot of young people. And I think some of it is, uh, they may not be aware of this particular thought in put in the way that you did that neither money nor machines can create. They shuttle tokens of energy, but they do not transform. A civilization based on them puts people out of touch with their own creative powers. Uh, you wrote this in an article. Um, and I think there is a, you know, people are aware of this, even if they've not articulated it in this clear fashion. Um, so what advice would you give to young people? <laughs> or any form of hand-holding that you would offer? <laughs> um, golly. You know, I, I think sometimes I used to try to talk to my students at, at uh, the college, Kenyan College, where I taught, about what the liberal arts mean. And, uh, you know, liberal in this sense, um, it's imagining people who are free. Uh, so there's the free person and there's the person who's not necessarily a slave, but who is uh, constrained by necessity. And um, so the fantasy would be, Suppose you were not constrained. Uh, you know, you're an 18 year old, you're in college, your parents wish you could go into finance because you'll have to earn a living. Suppose you were really free to do whatever you wanted with your life, what would you do? And um, would you, if you didn't need money, why you would not need to go on and try to figure out how to, how to make a killing in the market or whatever. You might in fact, uh, turn to dance or turn to poetry or turn to painting or turn to a sport or turn to something which uh, feeds your soul, but is entirely about that, not about um, your acquisitiveness. And um, as a thought experiment, it's at least useful for a young person to have that out there as uh, the alternative to all the other things. You know, all of us have to make a living. So it's it's not that there's a simple answer to this. Um, sometimes I would have them read uh, Henry Thoreau's Walden. And what Walden does at the first, his first chapter is called Economics. And um, he says that, you know, there are only three or four things that you absolutely have to have. You have to have food and you have to have shelter um, and warmth in the winter and so forth. And beyond that, uh, these are necessities. So you're, you're, you're constrained by these necessities. But then if you begin to acquire other necessities, every one of them constrains your freedom. Uh, so if, if, for example, you have to have a cell phone, <laughs> there's a whole string of things that go along with it. Then you have to have the money to buy it and you have to have the internet connectivity and, or if you have to have a car, on and on, and, and to see each of these things as in fact a diminishment of your freedom was Thoreau's lesson. And you know, people are always irritated by Thoreau because he seems to make such a demand. <laughs> you know, that they, but it, it's a kind of misreading. I mean, he does make a demand, but then it's back to you to figure out how to solve the solve the question. Um, but do most of the did most of your students? Um, respond to this um yeah. you know one has no idea sometimes they come back 10 years later and tell you they did but yeah. uh you yeah. know you you put these things out there and you think if they're true that some of them will take root <laughs> mm. yeah at any rate uh you know it's expanded people's sense of agency yes. because yes. because the the universe of possibility has been expanded yeah yeah, and and that itself is, I mean, in a sense, the primary responsibility of a teacher. And in a way, it also it demands for the student to begin to figure out what their talents are. 
Um, you yes. know, part of the point of going to college is not to be on a professional track, but to have the freedom for four years to uh, see what you're good at and what you're not good at and see what makes you happy and what doesn't make you happy. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Luz, you've made several references to us living in dark times, and I don't think it's only in the U.S. <laughs> no. uh, I think I think in many ways it's a global reality. Um, maybe on another occasion we'll talk about life in India. Uh, yeah. How are you holding yourself together? I mean, how do you um, grapple with it within yourself? Because I think the first realm of action is uh, to manage our own uh, psyche in such times. Uh, only then we are able to, you know, be engaging externally. When I was a child, I used to hunt for butterflies. So this was a childhood interest of mine. And then many years later, when I was in my thirties, I was spent the summer in a country house, and I became reinterested. And basically, ever since, uh, uh, I have an interest in lepidoptery in searching for butterflies. And I'm interested in why I do it and what I get from it, about which there's a lot to say. But in a way, it's about wonder. It's about being out in the world and seeing what's there and being attentive to it. Now, I'm trying to write something about it. But um, if you think about butterflies today, uh, what's really important is the way in which we are having species disappear because climate change is affecting habitat every place. And um, so we are, people say, at the brink of a potential sixth extinction. Um, so actually what I've been doing is reading a lot about climate change, but particularly about uh, the history of geology, geological time and evolutionary time because one of the problems with getting people to understand climate change is to understand the temporal differences between how you have to think about time to understand what's going on. So what I would say is, how am I dealing with dark times? I mean, it's important to me to keep something front and center that I really love and care about. And so the natural world and the life of butterflies <laughs> is in this category. But then it's important for me also to find the ways in which this uh, connects to the dark times we're in. And uh, so to the degree I'm writing about this, I'm simultaneously writing about uh, the wonder of natural history and the puzzles of how to how to have, how to begin to have uh, a culture that can think about climate change sufficiently to begin to have agency? Um, yeah. Because you know the real problem is we have neither economic nor political agency that can deal with what's going on. Yeah, yeah. That reminds me that you've also recently written a primer for forgetting. Yes. Uh, getting past the past. Now, uh, actually, we could have a whole conversation on that because that's a central challenge for us in India. Yeah. Okay, because um, uh, the past is bearing down uh, like, you know, like a mountain uh, yeah. on the present in a very, uh, in basically in ways that are deeply, toxically resentful. Is this uh, mostly about partition? And beyond, and beyond. Yeah. The idea that, you know, we are struggling with thousand years of um, foreign rule. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, can you just share something about, because I know it's, uh, I think everybody would appreciate that it's a very, very delicate dynamic between the need to remember yeah. and yet the need to let go of the past. But I'd like to hear you articulate that. <laughs> well, we should have another conversation where we talk about that book directly. But um, so, yes, uh, the book is an experiment in, it begins with the assumption, what if, what if we imagine forgetting is 
is good instead of bad because often we prize memory and rightly so memory is very important but what are the places where forgetfulness is more useful than remembering and i, I set the book up with four different sections one of them is about mythological stories about memory and forgetting and then one of them is about personal psychology uh, you know the easy case is an individual who's been traumatized how how does that person uh, work with trauma such that it doesn't dominate their life going forward it's not that you forget literally it's that you are, have some freedom from the memory it doesn't control you anymore and the third section is is more political it's about uh things like the south africa truth and reconciliation commission or uh what happened in kosovo or what happened in the united states around the civil war and the last section is about forgetfulness in art and spiritual life <laughs> So just to say, uh, to come back to India, which I don't write about, but I can tell you that the political piece is, is the most difficult one because, um, you know, an individual can say, well, this is my memory and I can work with it. The problem when you get into uh, politics, people don't agree on the memory. Uh, they, you know, they have conflicting stories about the past. And um, so uh you know i have a sort of sequence of what would have to happen uh in some cultural trauma to begin to put it into the past and it begins with truth but that's hard um <laughs> good luck getting the truth that could be a generation long project and then it begins with justice uh once you know what happened there should be some justice you can't just pretend it didn't happen and then there should be some recompense, reconciliation, uh, um, reparations, you know, some um, apology. You know, th there are these things that you can do after that are they're not simply justice. It's it's restorative justice. Um, anyway, th there are four or five things like that that have that have to happen in that order. You can't begin. I think people apologize too quickly often without having the truth or <clears throat> without having justice. And so, um, but I think it's worth having this model of say there, there is something valuable about forgetting. And now our problem is to figure out where and how we could, we could get to that valuable thing. Thank you. Any closing <laughs> thoughts, anything that well, you I have would one like to, or yeah, any question to, to me? No, I want to say one thing about violence. <laughs> yes, please. So there's a line in William Blake. He says, there are hirelings in the academy and in the courts who are trying to suppress intellectual life. Uh, what is it? He says, uh, encouraging corporeal conflict conflict by the suppression of intellectual conflict um that is his idea I, I, I think i'll send you this quote and get it correct but the idea is that um uh we have ways of contending with each other which are not violence that have to do with debate and argument and when you are unable to have debate and argument when you're unable to have um not agonistic conversation then it spills over into physical violence. And I think about it a lot, because in this country, one of the things that's happened is um, our politics has been infected by gerrymandering. And the effect of this is to have political um, locations where there's no, there's no um, contest between the different factions. One faction has taken over the entire apparatus. And the effect of this is to suppress debate um and the only debates that happen are the the, the radical wing of the dominant people will argue with this with the people and it just becomes more and more radical so i think there are many situations in which the suppression of debate and argument as a public form uh is a is a kind of violence and leads actually to physical violence that people become frustrated and they feel the only way that they can have an outlet for their position is yeah. to attack each other people. 
That's right. So, and it, it, so therefore, uh, dialogue is a very essential, uh, almost a kind of a condition for nonviolence. Yes, it is. It is. And, and you have to figure out how to have, uh, how to reduce the polarization such that people actually will talk to each other. Yeah. Well, you Hard know, one do. thing that a friend of mine has often, and she work, she does whole workshops around this, I'll send you her conversation. She says yeah. we could start by listening for the concern behind the complaint. Yeah, well, listening is a big part of conversation. But that is, <laughs> that is the first, yeah. uh, you know, demand, yeah. but they, that is a demand that's placed upon yeah. us. Yeah. yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And I hope to keep well, in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you.